All right, so welcome to our very first journey lecture of this academic year. And today we are very honored and excited to have Professor E. B., our much admired professor in the department. And Bramar did not be here, and she's out of town right now, and she asked me to host this event. And you know, I'm going to follow our tradition. Our tradition is to invite one of the professors favorite students. <laughs> so then, Steve, I, I will hand the microphone to you to introduce Professor E. Lee. And then, OK, we'll go from there. Disclaimer, this is random choice. <laughs> <laughs> Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Uh, so I have just a couple things to say to introduce Dr. Lee. Um, but also there was a couple students who really wanted to be here who couldn't. Um, and so we have a recording from one recent graduate as well um, and a long-term collaborator of Dr. Lee. So maybe I'll just introduce quickly and then I'll, I'll play those. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for the opportunity to be here today. Um, it's really an honor and a privilege to be able to introduce someone who was not just my advisor, but a real mentor and a friend through my academic journey. Um, so we're here to celebrate um, the remarkable career and achievements of Professor E. Lee and hear about his journey. Um, so as a now former PhD student of Dr. Lee, I can really attest to the profound impact he's had on my life and my career. Uh, so from the first day in the department, I've had the privilege of working under him and working under someone who is passionate for knowledge and dedication to research and unwavering support for his students is really extraordinary. Um, so Dr. Lee was not only my thesis advisor, but really a mentor in every sense of the word. Um, he possesses the innate ability to inspire his students to push the boundaries of their intellectual capabilities. He encourages us to question, to explore, and to discover. And if you're a student like me, he has a remarkable sense of patience. Um, so under his guidance, uh, I really learned what it meant to do research, uh, and not just about finding the right answers, but asking the right questions. Um, and beyond academics, Dr. Lee is really compassionate and empathetic individual who cares about the well-being and success of his students. Um, his door is always open for guidance and support or even just a friendly chat. Um, and so now I, I'd like to play just a couple words from some other people and then I can, I can introduce Dr. Lee. A former student from the Dr. Lee's group, and my privilege to share my thoughts about my remarkable advisor, Dr. Lee. Dr. Lee is an exceptional researcher. Um, his commitment to the details in research, whether in papers or presentations, is unparalleled. Dr. Lee's dedication to checking every notation, punctuation, and reference has probably been a strategy in our work. However, for the sense of the past is not just his expertise in the field, but his profound attention to his students. I still recall the invaluable guidance he provided during my job search last year. Uh, even after my graduation, our regular meeting continued, and his mentorship remains in, an invaluable part of my ongoing projects. Uh, in closing, I would like to express my deepest gratitude without Lee for his guidance, wisdom, and unwavering support throughout my doctoral journey. He is not just an advisor, but a role model, and I feel privileged to be part of his journey. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for shaping us into the scholars we are today. Then I also just like to play a few words from one of Dr. Lee's long term collaborators. Um, so, Dr. David Cristiani is a pulmonary critical care physician at Harvard uh, Mass General and also a professor um, in the Harvard School of Public Health. Hello, everyone. And colleagues who have invited Professor E. Lee to give his journey lecture. It's my pleasure and my privilege to offer some comments. I met E about 20 years ago when he joined the Harvard faculty, Harvard School of Public Health, and the Dana Farber Cancer Institute um, as a biostatistician. His expertise in survival uh, was very relevant for the work uh, we were doing in my research group. 
Uh, in particular, at that time, we actually started working on survival analysis for case cohort studies and case only studies of patients with acute respiratory failure. Uh, this is in the early 2000s, well before the SARS 2 uh, epidemic. And we were uh, examining uh, other causes of respiratory failure. The survival analysis techniques we brought uh, were very valuable to myself and our team members, and he served as a member of the thesis committee uh, for several of my doctoral students. We soon uh, moved on to Michigan in an illustrious position, and, and I was happy to reconnect with him on a large program uh, on lung cancer survival. Uh, he's been a key collaborator and a key member of the team for over uh, almost 10 years now and our lung cancer survival cohort, as well as the Boston lung cancer survival cohort, and in our work in the International Lung Cancer Consortium, which is a consortium that's accumulated over 100,000 cases and controls of lung cancer. The consortium focuses mainly on causes of lung cancer and genetic susceptibility and interactions with environmental factors. We've, um, as a subset of that group, have focused on determinants of survival, uh, genetic, non-genetic, environmental, social, uh, treatment modalities, a whole panoply of potential predictors of uh, survival in lung cancer. <clears throat> um, Professor Lee has provided his innovative approaches to survival in this project that have been indispensable to our work. Um, his, his worldwide recognition for survival analysis is obviously special to our work. Uh, it's only with uh, Professor Lee that we can do uh, accurate, up-to-date methodologies, recognizing the limitations of, of uh, certain techniques and the strengths of models, such as the Cox proportional hazards models. Uh, Professor Lee and other colleagues have also introduced uh, methods where we can integrate social determinants of health into our survival analysis. Uh, and it's just going extremely well. Without him, this work could not be possible. Uh, Professor Lee has been obviously an important colleague and he's also a close friend all these years. We share students and postdocs um, and our junior faculty uh, who've gone on and are going on to a great career. Um, I can't estimate, overestimate the value of for me has been to my work um, and the work of my colleagues at Harvard and I look forward to continuing collaboration with them. So Professor Lee Yi, thank you for inviting me to give these comments and I hope you have a wonderful experience uh, in your journey lecture with our colleagues at Washington. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, for today, we're celebrating Dr. Lee's journey, which is a testament to his years of dedication, hard work, and significant contributions he's made to our field. So I have no doubt that this lecture will leave us all inspired and enriched. And so please uh, join me in giving him a warm welcome as he shares his journey, knowledge, and wisdom. And thank you for being a guiding light in so many of our lives. And your impact on the world of academia and your students is immeasurable, and we're honored to be a part of your legacy. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Steve, uh, for this uh, extraordinary introduction. So uh, when Burma asked me to uh, make this uh, journey lecture one year ago, I was very hesitant because normally I only do uh, technical seminars or do job talks, right? But this is a talk about my life. I really don't know how to do this. So I was really in a panic mode. Then. I, what I do, I just told my group, right? I really have a fabulous group. I, I told my guys what I should cover all the guys say, oh, you should talk about uh, academics. You know, you should bring your wife here. You, you should talk about your hobbies and uh, then why you want to come here. And uh, then anything that will lead to your research, any practical tips or so advice. So, oh my gosh, after this, 
I lost a lot, many lines of sleep, right? <laughs> but finally, I figure out, okay, I sent out, I come up with some uh, stories, and then I'm very happy to be here to share with you as a friend, right? Not really as a family member, but mostly as a friend, okay? And hopefully, actually, you, some of the uh, suggestions, you know, some of my career paths may be helpful to you. Or even if some suggestions may not be applicable, at least when you interact with me, when you deal with me, you will know where I come from, right? So I think actually, perhaps this is what we can achieve at the end of this uh, presentation. Um, again, actually, as uh, normally as in my class, feel free to interrupt me, you know, for any questions. So right? I'll be very happy to address any questions. So first thing first is actually where, where did I come from, right? So so here, these are the major cities, you know, I live in for two or more years, right? So hopefully, actually, you can figure out some. And can anybody figure out which city this is? Jordan's, right? Okay, Jordan's. What about this one? Boston. Boston. Right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, of course. Probably just came from that aquarium, right? And this is, of course, an arbor, right? Okay, so for, for these two parts here, you, you may not be so familiar. Actually, this part of city, actually, this is a Chengdu. This is where I was raised up, right? So where I was born and I spent my childhood there. And then this is a city, Nanjing. So this is where I spent my college life uh, at. So just to give you a little bit um, for the people who are not very uh, familiar with uh, with uh, this China uh, map. So this is uh, this is where I, where I grew up, Chengdu. So it's like the okay. Talking about the latitude and longitude, if you map to the U.S., <laughs> it's between Dallas and Atlanta. Okay, so now you, you, you got an idea where this is, right? <laughs> okay, so I, had, I did a little bit of due diligence, so. <laughs> and the Nanjing is here. So everybody heard about Shanghai, right? So Nanjing is like the backyard of Shanghai. So it's, uh, <laughs> no offense, okay, no offense. No offense to Shanghai or Nanjing, so. Uh, so. So it, it's uh, now with this high speed train, probably one hour will take you from Shanghai to Nanjing. But back to my time, it, it took about like five hours. So it's uh, not too bad. Okay, so um, basically after I uh, grew up, I I went to Nanjing University instead of like Beijing University There's for some reasons, actually, for some reasons. Okay, okay, so. Uh, because I really want to study mathematics, okay, so uh, so that's why I chose Nanda, not Beida. Don't need no offense for no, no, no offense. Oh, okay, good. Okay, so I I I majored in mathematics because in the I really want to be a mathematician, you know, later on. So I I learned a lot of math, right, ranging from you know functional functional um, analysis, topology, or anything. You know, you you, you probably uh, some of you heard about it, some of you may not be so familiar with. Very unfortunately, I did not learn statistics. I learned all the probability. I learned all the major theory, but I unfortunately uh, I didn't learn stat because actually uh, that was really unfortunate. I uh, this is like in my junior year, um, I was having an exercise. I did, I develop a code, and then this code the flu just developed into this. Um, you know, sort of like a myocarditis. Okay, so I was hospitalized for of almost like half semester. Okay, so that's why I, you know, we, we had this course like a probability and statistics. I only did a probability. <laughs> and then I learned everything in hospital of a statistics. So I still did quite well, but I feel actually I was not really professional trained statistically. So now I still feel I'm very short of a statistics. I think I'm okay with the probability, but I'm not very, <laughs> yeah, so statistics is sort of my, my weakness. Okay, so um, after Nanda or Lange University, I uh, I went to Chunan. Uh, so this is where New Orleans, you know, came to my, you know, uh, 
you know, I'm I'm a right-handed. I, I tend to look at this way, right? I didn't mean actually I, I will overlook you know my my, my friends at, on, on this side. Um, so I went to Tulan. Uh, I, 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 I continue to study mathematics. Okay, so we did a, you know, topology, you know, algebra, computational math, or so on, right? And then uh, I, I also uh, did quite well, actually, in my qualified exam, right? But then still, actually, then I was wondering what we, what I wanted to do uh, next, right? Because actually, then I need to choose my advisor, choose my field, then, um, you know, for mathematics, because actually at that time I was also interested in medical science, right? I was looking at how to combine mathematics and uh, uh, medical science, right? So until I received received a phone call from from this gentleman, uh, Tony uh, Tony Shock. So I still remember this is one sunny afternoon, right? And actually, I was uh, I was working as a TA, and I was in my TA office, and doctor, and I just received a phone call. You know, my office mate told, told me, oh, you got a phone call from a uh, from guy from Michigan. Okay, so Dr. Dr. Tony Shock said, okay, um, would you like to come to Michigan? We, uh, you know, we can offer you uh, admission to our program and with a, a TA, okay? And um, basically, at that time, actually, in, in here, right? So right now, we, we give you like a, I don't know how many months, you know, uh, notice, right? So you, you can write, but basically, at that time, you yes or no, right? Just a phone call. This, I say, oh, of course, I, I love Michigan. Uh, and I'm quite familiar with Michigan. And I'll tell you the reason why, personally, I'm very familiar with Michigan. And the uh, retrospective, you know, this is really like the career changing call, you know, from Michigan. So this is why Michigan just came into my my life, you know, uh, both personally and professionally. Okay, and uh, uh, Dr. Tony Shaw, this is a really a uh, uh, gentleman I really admired. Oh, actually, I I even had more interactions with with uh, Dr. Tony Shaw, you know, after I came to Michigan. So, uh, for example, I I, I took this uh, multivariate analysis, you know, from uh, uh, from Tony Short, and he was a very clear instructor, and uh, the materials learned from Tony uh, Short actually was very useful for my research. Okay, so actually at the tech, we we have been developing the so called star rating system, right, to to rank. To score, you know, every dialysis facility, uh, every dialysis facility in this country, right? Because each facility will have, you know, many, you know, different metrics on different, uh, you know, different dimensions, right? But those dimensions they actually could be correlated, right? So how to get this summarized score? Well, we have to use so-called factor analysis, right? So basically, factor analysis is something I learned, you know, from Dr. Tony Short. So actually, um, the you know so uh, Steve sitting here actually Steve actually used this technique a lot. Now you know Eileen actually is, uh, has taken over. So that's why I owed a lot of you know things you know to Dr. Tony Short. So okay, so now let me talk about uh, Michigan. So I went to Michigan. So Michigan actually when I when I came. It was uh, small, but the but the but the, the department was already very extremely strong. So we had uh, this just some random water like Mark, Radito, Rob Schroderman, Bob Wolf, Morton Brown, and uh, Ken Nang, uh, Jonathan Ras, uh, Mike Banky, Raghu, Dr. K, Xu Hong. I believe right at that time, uh, Radito actually was. Uh, um, our chair, and he just moved from UCLA, UCLA and Xi Hong was still like a first year assistant professor. And uh, sorry, Jeremy, you are not on the list. <laughs> you are still in UCLA, right? So, yeah, I, I normally I had a very bad memory, but I remember very vivid. I, I checked the list, I'm going to make sure it did. I discredited, <laughs> you know, Dr. Jeremy Taylor, but Jeremy, I, I believe you were still in uh, UCLA then. Okay. So um, uh, I waived uh, 601. I know a lot of you know students here you run uh, wave 601 and took 801. So 
at that time, actually, this eight one actually was jointly uh, taught by Ralito, Ra Robert Strodman, Jonathan Reyes. Okay, so uh, the, uh, this book actually was something we used, right? So I, actually, I found the transition from math to statistics so difficult because I still had no idea what this talk, what the book is about, right? <laughs> you know, this book was still actually uh, in my um, bookshelf. You know, I still try to read this on a daily basis. You know, uh, there are still a lot of things I, now there are a lot of things I understand, but still a lot of things I don't understand. Also, by the way, when I uh, joined the department, actually uh, SPH1 and SPH2 are, were disconnected, right? There's no, uh, no bridge, by the way. Okay, so then I'm going to talk about okay how the the experience I got my six oh one waived. Okay, so actually then I took my first exam at Michigan. This is a uh, Dr. Robert Strodman, very friend. Actually, he not his my very very good friend. So, uh, but back then he didn't have much smile, right? <laughs> so, uh, so for for our student, what 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 this is. Tell me what this is about. This epsilon of delta. Folks, help me. <laughs> huh? Qualified exam. <laughs> no, no, not the qualified exam. This, this is a, this is the exam. He said, okay, I, I approached the, uh, uh, Dr. Strodman. I said, I want to get my 601 waived. He said, I, 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 I was expecting him. He said, okay, what is a, what the textbook you used, right? And then what, uh, uh, who was your instructor, so on, right? Yeah. Instead, he said, okay, come to my blackboard and write, use Everstone Delta language to describe convergence in probability. Okay, so this is what my, this is why actually I remember this is exactly what I, something I wrote. It's the only thing here is actually because I use a, a PP uh, PowerPoint. So I really use epsilon and the detail is delta, right? So actually th 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 this is something I wrote on the blackboard and say, oh, okay, okay. No, you don't have to take my class. <laughs> <laughs> so now I still remember very, very vividly actually what this convergence in property is all about. Okay, so, um, so now talk about actually then uh, my 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 research right so uh, so actually then actually I uh, when 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 Steve uh, introduced me and also when uh, Doctor um, Doctor David Christiani talk, uh, introduced me he he keep talking about survival analysis right actually this is indeed my my area so why I actually uh, chose this area actually there's some reasons okay so. First, actually, I took a stochastic process in finance, you know, from the statistics department, right? Uh, actually, I got it from Steve Cole, Sam Cole's, you know, brother, right? I believe now he's in Columbia. So I took this, uh, took this class, actually, uh, in this class, he kept talking about the options, you know, stock options or so on. Uh, I had no idea. Uh, even though I got a very... Uh, I got a great score from this class. I still don't like, nowadays, I still don't know what the option is, right? And uh, uh, keep talking about uh, American options, European options. I say, my, my God, why, why there's no Asian options, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then I decided, okay, I need to come back to the bioset department and then retake the stochastic process. Then I took the, Bio 875. This is uh, uh, at advanced level of the uh, survival class, right? So actually, Robert Strudman actually was uh, the instructor uh, for this. And then the textbook we used actually is a counting process and the survival analysis, right? So uh, written by uh, uh, Fleming and Harrison, right? So actually, this is a book we used. So actually, um, I, I found actually this modern scale theory very intriguing and useful because now even if you have some very core event but somehow with this martingale thing here conditional on the history you have some uncor uncorrelated uh, representation i think this is this is magnificent uh, this is a just wonderful representation so then i decided to uh, use a 
take the survival as my my major and uh, uh, this is you know how I uh, chose my uh, research area so uh, so uh, so actually this so-called counting process this book actually was also something I I like to you I like to read on a daily basis so I still uh, I think it's quite useful okay so I this actually this is a committee uh, for my dissertation. So you can see this is the Dr. Lin, uh, Dr. Little, and the Dr. Susan Murphy. Right? Okay, so I, I once I, I was talk, chatting with uh, Walter, and he said this is very high pressure committee. So how you can pass this, your your exam, your 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 dissertation, uh, um, um, your dissertation is uh, is is, uh, is a, like a miracle. But anyway, so I think actually. Uh, I, I was uh, working, uh, I, yeah, I, I'll tell you actually, Xi Hong helped me a lot. Actually, I really uh, benefit a lot from Xi Hong. And I, I actually, I learned, it's better, I learned how to write the good papers you know, from Xi Hong. So uh, we published in Biometrica, JASA, and uh, uh, Biometrics. So there's a funny story about this Biometrics publication. So we, uh, the, the, so now, because, we sent the I sent this uh, paper back to Biometrics. Biometrics said, "Okay, how come actually you sent like a very old version to us?" Then I realized that I did a bad mistake. So now I know actually in the future I have to be very careful. So this is a glitch about this biostat biometrics paper. Okay, so okay, so uh, for the people actually when I was a graduate student. I lived in Northwood, right? So uh, for the people in familiar with uh, North Campus, do you know what this is? Right, you know, this engineering, uh, you know, library, right? So, because actually in my thesis, it requires a lot of, uh, you know, uh, and empirical, you know, process theory, non parametric MOE, like the probability convergence in a functional space, because actually, because my model is very complicated, right? That, that baseline header function just cannot be canceled out, as you know, I showed you in my survival class, right? Right. So, but my model is just very nasty. So <laughs> then I have to learn all the stuff here. So I just uh, spend a lot of uh, nights, you know, in this library. Okay. So that's why I, I think this is quite a useful um, uh, place. So I think actually this is good. Okay. So after after Michigan, I went to uh, Boston. So now I just want to just show my life. Uh, you know how my life has been uh, at uh, uh, in Boston, also at the Longwood campus, right? So this 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 is the yard of the um, of the Harvard Medical School, right? So basically, this is the main building of the Harvard Medical School. I believe actually Harvard School of Public Health is somewhere you you cannot see here, just behind this building, right? So okay. and then Della Harbor is the other direction. So okay, so. I just Google this, right? So now you can see here, I just within this Harvard, uh, Nangwood campus, there are so many, uh, they are all connected, right? So there, there is a Beth Israel uh, Hospital, Josh Lynn, uh, this is a Dela Faber, and then Children's Hospital, Medical School, and then this is Harvard School of Public Health, right? Okay, so, and then this, this, oh, this path here actually so called as a Longwood Avenue. And I can I I I can just testify that uh, the 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 pace at this Longwood Avenue was very fast. It's basically around like eight to nine people walked very very fast. Okay, and then if you uh, if you're walking a little bit slowly, people behind you would push you outside. <laughs> Exactly. So this is so you can see here are many people you know rush to their work and then the, the pace they are just very uh hasty. Okay. So um so I think actually I, I have an office uh here. Then later on we move our office to here just before the Israel uh uh, hospital, and then we, uh, and then we all, we, you know, do our meetings here at the Harvard School of Health. Okay, so uh, back in uh, Boston, 
So uh, this, yeah, I also just record, this is my first course. This is a bio 250, okay? Bio 250 is like our 801 here. Okay, so Harvard have a different uh, numbering system. So uh, every course starts with like a two, right? I believe actually 240 above is like a, our 800 levels uh, courses. And uh, I believe actually survival uh, is 244, right? And then the 250 actually is uh, so-called measure theory. So this major theory actually used to be taught by LJ Way, Steve Lagacos, and Bob Gray. Okay, so and then later on they decided not to offer this because the workload might be too much. Um, and then Louis Ryan suggested that I take over. Okay, so I I just did, did so. Uh, it turns out I think this is a very uh, good opportunity for me. So I didn't spend much time uh, working on this course, and I just wrote a, a course note, right? And I did quite well at the uh, UN won a, a teaching award, you know, from the Harvard School of Public Health. I think this is uh, this is something I'm I'm very happy with. And I believe actually this used to be the classroom I, where I uh, taught this class. So, Okay, so we were talking about, yeah, Louis Ryan actually was my mentor. So actually I did uh, uh, benefit, my career did benefit a lot from Louis Ryan. So this is a photo I took when our daughter was born. And then I believe actually Xi Hong was visiting, uh, with, uh, was visiting Boston and then Louis Ryan was with her. And then Louis Ryan and Xi Hong just went to, also went to see the baby. So this is a baby actually, when I showed this uh, uh, photo to my, to my daughter, she was asking who this baby was. <laughs> okay, so yeah. Okay, so uh, th 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 this is uh, some uh, uh, advice, you know, from Louis from Louis Ryan. So, because uh, she was my mentor, uh, she uh, she sometimes she she gave me some very good advice, right? So, uh, she uh, asked me, right? So, if you want to do something here, just start now, right? Do not procrastinate, right? Just make sure you you will spend every day, okay? And then also be a multitasker, right? So if you wanna uh, survive in an academic environment, you cannot only just focus on one thing. You have to uh, be able to efficiently manage your time so that you will be able to uh, accommodate you know, many tasks. And also uh, apply for grants earlier, right? So, uh, so also be a balanced about statistician. So we are, she said, actually, then in order to do a good biostatistician, you, you have to address both bio and the statistics, right? So you, in other words, you have to be like a 50-50. So, so, you know, uh, so, so this is also some, something I, I, try to, um, um, I try to follow, right? So when I develop my publications, I try to make sure 50% of them you know, are statistical, methodological, or 50% actually are applied uh, uh, publications. Uh, so when uh, when Louise Ryan actually was uh, the, the, the chair, actually she later on, she also became the chair uh, for the Harvard uh, Biostat Department for several years. Uh, <laughs> When uh, when she left the department, you know, when she left the department to uh for Australia, her gift was to give everybody this uh, so called uh, grant bible. I, I think this is a grant the grant application uh, writer's workbook, right? So I find actually this quite useful. You can see here this is a home copy, right? Certainly, I also have a, like an office copy. I even thinking about having the living room copy and the bedroom copy. <laughs> so that's <laughs> Okay, so uh, so so talking about the grant, right? So uh, so because actually she said actually I should uh, apply uh, for grants earlier, right? So actually I I started the draft drafting uh, grants uh, during my first year at Harvard. Okay, so my grant actually uh, focused on spatial survival models, right? So uh, so in other words, actually, so you are talking about uh, the patients or the but every patient here, actually, everybody basically is correlated to somebody else in, in some fashion. So uh, 
I my first submission actually got a score. I believe I still remember actually I got a score like a one eighty, right? So Jeremy, this was like many years ago, right? That score actually I think below one fifty was very good, right? So one eighty, actually I only got a twenty eight percent for the first submission. So uh, well, Louis Ryan said, oh, at least your 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 grant got a score, so don't 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 don't, don't be so upset. Okay, so so the you only need to do is just address the you know the questions or concerns and the keep polishing, 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 right? So uh the the my signal admission uh, submission just got a very a very good score. So it's uh, the percentile was very, very good. So so normally you want to see this number as low as possible, right? So mostly right now, you want to make sure this below 10% that will be safe, right? Okay, so uh, I basically, I got my, my first grant actually just in my uh, second year as a faculty uh, member. And then uh, soon after this, actually, I, I, I began to serve in a BMRD uh, uh, after, and also actually I also served uh, in many NIH uh, uh, study sections. So I actually, I was, uh, I don't know, I, I think Brian, by by today, actually now I'm still reviewing nine nine grants actually yesterday. So, um, so I I I believe actually so far I have reviewed more than five hundred grants. So I in you know basically within one or you know five minutes I can tell you know which grant is good, which grant actually should be uh, arbitrage. So. Okay, so these are the uh, early works actually in sp uh, spatial survival uh, models. Actually, I think actually this is very, uh, very uh, hard topic. Usually, actually the Bayesians actually do this, right? But as a frequent is I, I, you know, I also, I actually I was a as a as a as a frequentist actually. Uh, so, you know, Louis and Ryan and I, we were the first uh, uh, people to propose actually. Uh, you uh, modeling spatial survival data using the uh, semi-climatic fertile survival models. Okay. And then later on, uh, uh, Xi Hong and I were also re writing a, a paper. Actually, in this paper, we, we were talking about, okay, so normally actually, um, I think actually in longitudinal uh, studies, we talk about the marginal model versus the random effects model, right? We say actually those coefficients actually do not have the same interpretation, right? So one challenging question here is, can you develop a model such that your coefficients have both marginal and random effects interpretations? So actually this is this paper is about that. Okay, so this is a very um, uh, challenging uh, project. Okay, so, uh, but anyway, so th these works actually were uh, were supported by my by my first grant, and uh, this actually can, this also led to uh, many other uh, publications. So in particular, with my my work with Ross Prentice, you know, Ross Prentice was, uh, he is a very uh, well-established, uh, well-respected researcher in survival analysis, okay? And uh, uh, he, Ross, actually noted uh, uh, our work, Li and Lin, so basically this work, right? And then uh, then he said, oh, he was actually about to come up with something very similar, but he realized that our work just came out earlier. So I was feeling very uh, lucky. <laughs> okay, so later on, actually, we just uh, uh, worked together with, uh, you know, our old friend, Ross Prentice, and then we published something in Biometrica, and then, we do this bivariate survival, right? So Ross likes to do the bivariate survival. So I think this is a good, um, very uh, cool project we did with Ross. Okay, so uh, then I will talk about, um, in the very beginning, my work was mostly actually sort of like a traditional, uh, you know, in traditional survival analysis, right? Although we have uh, some uh, um, uh, interesting, you know, features, you know, measurement error or spatial survival or so on, right? Now, why I got into this machine learning or high dimensional data, right? I think this was really attributed to a uh, panel discussion uh, back and uh, at Harvard many years ago. So I hear I said Marvin got an idea. So this is Marvin and this is a LG. So so uh so actually uh back you know 15 years ago so uh uh, uh Brad Efron and Colin Beck 
were visiting Harvard the same day, okay? <laughs> then Marvin just said, Yili, why don't you organize something and talk about our future? So for, for whatever reason, Marvin always addressed me as Yili. Everybody else addressed me Yi, right? He said Yili, because he, he wanna emphasize that's you. <laughs> he said, Yili, why don't you do something, okay? Because we wanna take advantage of these two important guys, right? And then uh, later on, Dave Harrison also said, oh, this is a great idea. Uh, we should do this. Okay, so well, uh, then I just organized a, a panel discussion. Uh, uh, and then this panel discussion was held in, um, in Boston uh, in 2028. 20, uh, uh, this discussion actually focused on the growth and the future of biostatistics and the statistics. And also we talk about the connection with uh, probability, biology, you know, uh, bioinformatics and computer science, right? So, you know, this, this conversation happened 15 years ago. And then I actually, I will show you what we discussed and actually, Many years later, I still think actually a lot of um, uh, contents actually were still quite applicable to today's uh, statistical world. Okay, so um, then I just pulled the you know the uh, in the Harvard School of Public Health and the data Barber faculty, the biostatistical faculty, and then we had the following topics to talk about. Right. So, you know, the first topic here is whether the biostat should continue to be a separate discipline, you know, uh, aside from statistics. Okay. So, and also the second question here is, you know, how the biostat or the statistic should respond to the, you know, the computational to the computational challenges, especially due to the big data, right? So at that time, we are talking about the computational intensive modeling or big data challenges. Okay, and then how can we fill fill the gap between the sophistication of a method or statistic methods and the simplicity of the methods, right? So how to fill the gap? And also a follow-up question here is how to make our methods gain the widespread, widespread popularity, how to make our methods useful, basically. I think those are the very, very relevant questions. So I, I think that the, the discussion that were quite useful. Okay, and then how should the biology and the computational biology and the bioinformatics you know, set in relationship you know, to bar statistics, right? So, and also the last question which was very, very funny. So, cause actually the Terra Speed said actually uh, in most of the situations, it, it turns out uh, the, the probability, probability model may not be, uh, or probability assessment may not be so useful. So then the Harvard faculty, they just try to understand are we or aren't we better off without probability, right? So there, there are very uh, interesting discussions. Actually, you can find the transcript actually in my on my uh, personal website. So I don't want uh, sp to uh, sp uh, spend too much time on this. But actually, I will tell you actually one line of the conversation actually is quite helpful. Um, actually, quite, actually lead to my future research. So. Basically, the inference does matter even in the big data area. Okay, so this is just based on the Efron's response to LJ's question uh, during the discussion. So basically, the, during the discussion, LJ Wei said, okay, oh, he, he found actually it's very difficult to explain um, to bioinformatics, you know, how to quantify the uncertainty of the estimates, right? So can we just give the prediction without quantifying the uncertainty? Then, then the Efron said, no, we have to do inference because uh, it is a crucial part. With this actually, the inference part is the crucial part we provide to the other fields. If we do not, the science will suffer. Okay, so I, I took this. So now you can see here, actually, a lot of my work actually actually was on or has been on the high dimensional inference. So for example, I graduated, uh, recently I graduated two students, right? Uh, Fei Zhe, and his, uh, his actually thesis actually was on high dimensional inference, actually publishing uh, in uh, Biometrics, uh, Journal of Machine Learning, uh, JASA. 
and uh, Lu Lu is there? Oh, and Lu Lu uh, thesis that was also on you know high dimensional uh, inference. So because I think actually this is quite an important field. Okay, so basically, actually, you can see actually this is a this is a, a how my research has been evolving, right? So you can see I started with something very traditional. Actually, I'm still doing that because I think actually it is fun because I started with measurement error, correlated survival, uh, cancer clinical trials. And then I move on to cure modeling. You know, actually, I read a lot of the Jeremy uh, Taylor's uh, papers on cure modeling. I think that this is great. Then I also. Uh, uh, then I also move on to talk about uh, machine learning, uh, functional data analysis, and also uh, in infectious disease modeling. So I, I think actually you can see actually basic as a statistician or as a biostatistician, your research should respond to science, right? To the uh, involvement of the science. Okay, so now I want to use the rest of time to talk about the uh, uh, my my recent uh, uh, research, especially uh, my my research actually uh, in the non cancer field, right? So this is uh, my long term uh, collaborator, uh, David Christiani. Uh, so he's a um, uh, he's a professor of uh, environmental health, and also he's an oncologist uh, oncologist uh, in um, MGH. So actually, I also noted that actually he he is also a member of a National Cancer Advisory Board of, of, appointed by President Obama um, 12 years ago. And uh, then he's a PI of the Boston Lung Cancer uh, Survival Cohort. Actually, uh, I believe that Sha Lu actually used this uh, a cohort to, uh, to do her thesis. Actually, David actually has been my, uh, my uh, very close friend uh, for many years. So this actually is a very good uh, resource for our statistical research. So in this cohort, we had uh, this cohort actually ha has a uh, uh, twelve thousand uh, uh, adult uh, cancer cases uh, enrolled from MGH and Delta Harbor uh, since nineteen ninety two. So you can see actually yeah, the follow up time actually was uh, very long. So we had a uh, very detailed information. We have the clinical uh, demographic information, and we also uh, have the uh, genetic information. So. So everybody heard about, probably if, if you are doing the cancer research, you heard about the EGFR, right? It turns out this cohort was the first study that discovered that the EGFR mutation actually was involved in the treatment response. So actually, because this finding, this because of this finding, the you know the 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 area of this target therapy actually just began. So I think this uh, so that's why this uh, uh, cohort actually was quite uh, in, important. So I have been serving on uh, th th this uh, cohort for as a stat as a statistical investigator um, for some years. Actually, because of my involvement in this. Uh, in this cohort, actually, my group actually got access to this data set. Actually, then we will be able to develop, you know, many, many uh, methodological uh, publications. So, so this is just uh, some random sample of what we developed, you know, so on. So I think actually Steve also, uh, in our first role here, Steve actually uh, used this cohort to develop his uh, thesis, right? So actually, I also want to highlight this uh, thesis and, uh, and also Jan actually also used this uh, cohort to uh, develop a paper in Biometrica. So uh, we also, uh, so we actually, uh, yeah, so you can see a, a lot of uh, papers actually, you can see this, uh, Lu Xia also developed the paper um, public in Biometrics. So I, I think actually we are quite uh, uh, productive uh, in using this data to uh, publish in, uh, in statistical journals. Uh, so th those are all the statistical uh, uh, publications, but I, I I didn't list the uh, applied publications. So actually, applied publications actually some some of them actually are even more important. Okay, so now I just uh, want to talk about briefly talk about the Steve uh, Steve's work. So as you can see, actually I I I, I told you actually Steve uh, is uh, my random choice, but no, I, I was not actually Steve actually was very uh, Steve actually is very very good. So uh, I I also have a very good uh, relationship with the Steve family. So um, so uh, Steve. Uh, 
your father, mother, actually, uh, they, they shared a lot of uh, Steve, Steve's uh, you know, journey and Steve's story. So I, that's, uh, that's great to learn as well. So for, for example, Steve can cook, right? Everybody heard about that, right? So, okay, so um, I just want to just briefly highlight what, uh, uh, how Steve actually utilized uh, this cohort to develop its uh, thesis, right? So, uh, so yeah, this actually, is, you, you can see here, actually, the basic here, we are talking about, you know, when people get cancer, right? So there are several paths, you know, to, uh, to, to death, right? So you can, after you get cancer, you can die with, even without a disease progression, or you can die uh, after you got a disease progression, right? So this is how, uh, so, but the, 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 the point here is time to progression and also time to death here, they can be, Competing, right? So actually, they are. This is called the semi-competing risk data. Then, when you do not account for their correlation, your results actually can be uh, can be biased, right? So normally, actually, people just use a so-called progression-free survival, right? So they just uh, combine these two endpoints, right? So, but you may lose information. Okay, so what Steve did here is actually he just tried to sort out their correlations and then just really model this time to progression and also time to death, and then also account for their correlations. So in order to do this, he also wants to you know, make sure we do not you know, put too many parametric assumptions there, then he just used a so-called deep learning to do that. So he he just extend the, extended the so-called EM algorithm by by including the so-called deep neural network uh, step. So and it turns out uh, he will be able to use this to quantify people's uh, non-parametric you know, risk functions, uh, which was very helpful. So uh, Steve actually did a very uh, good job uh, in this way. And then he will also be able to uh, calculate, you know, estimate the baseline hazard for progression and the deaths, right? So I, I, and I think actually the, 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 this is a very useful information for physicians to really evaluate the, the treatment uh, efficacy. Okay, so I also want to uh, also briefly touch upon actually uh, another student that we also graduated this year. So this is a Yu Min Sang. Actually, uh, uh, he's a, he uh, he was a student uh, co-advised by Dr. Professor Jian Kang and me. So, uh, so in this work, he was trying to use this uh, radiomic data to uh, to uh, to estimate to predict the people's survival. So uh, so here we use the the lung cancer data set and then the a, 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 cool, a subset of the lung cancer uh, patients actually also uh, had radiomics, right? So how to you utilize this radiomics data to uh, to pr pr predict the survival. So, so this is something we we uh, mean uh, did in his thesis. So, so basically, actually, you can see here we use this computed uh, tomography. Uh, we utilize the data. So basically, you the patient will be here, and you put the patient inside, and then the machine actually will give you the three D, a three D uh, plus. Then and then you just segmentize this, and then you will get this like two dimensional uh, data, right? So and then how to utilize this segmentize the data to do the prediction. So we propose uh, he proposed the so called uh, Deep partially linear regression model, right? So the, the G zero here, they are just this is just model uh, the clinical features. They can have some very complicated relationship with uh, survival, right? So for example, BMI, age, or so on. So and then the first part here, this part here is for the radiomic feature because we are not so sure about them. So we try to do the variable selection, right? So in order to do the variable selection the simplest form is have this linear form, right? So, so that's why we developed the, the so-called deep, um, the partially linear cut model, right? But the, again, we try to reduce the, uh, the requirement for the parametric assumption, right? So we, we, we just model this G0 using the deep learning, right? Using that artificial intelligence um, uh, methodologies. Okay, so it turns out uh, using our model, this is our the first row here. Actually, we will be able to achieve better prediction performance in terms of uh, the C step, right? C step basically characterize how predictive your model is, right? So we are 
we are okay. Uh, we are we are better than the other uh, existing methods, like some uh, machine learning methods, and also some uh, uh, deep survival model. Deep survival model basically it's a survival model using deep learning without doing the selection model selection. Okay, so and then based on our uh, the work, we are able to identify some. Uh, uh, radiomic features which are important for predicting patient survival. So I think this is uh, quite useful. And then we were able to, you know, come up with some very uh, good clinical stories. For example, by using the deep learning, we will be able we will be able to come up with a non-parametric risk score. And it turns out we will be able to find out actually as for the non-cancer patients, as the age increase, there's a higher mortality. And then as uh, BMI increase, it turns out the, the risk decreases. So actually this is very interesting. So normally we say BMI is bad, right? But for the non-cancer patients, BMI is protective. Okay, so you do want to have enough you know, fat to maintain your, uh, maintain your, uh, your life, right? Okay, so now enough work, right? So uh, I, I believe actually my, my student actually also asked me to talk about uh, what do you do when you are not working, right? Okay, so I watch football, right? American football. So for the people who uh, may be uh, familiar with, with the football, do you know, can you recognize who, who this gentleman was? This is Tom Brady. Oh. This is Tom Brady. Okay, and then this is a Brian Gracie. Brian Gracie actually was a quarterback. Uh, uh, and then, so when I uh, I found actually when I began to follow foot follow sports, normally the team will do better. <laughs> okay, so Michigan got their football national championship for the first time within the last fifty years. Okay, because I follow them. <laughs> this is uh, Brian Gracie. Actually, they beat the Ohio State, right? And won the uh, the Big Ten Championship. And uh, then later on, they also won the Rose Bowl, right? By beating the Washington State University, right? I said, actually, because now I even watch the hockey game, right? The Michigan hockey also won the national championship the same year. Okay, then I joined, I, I moved to Boston, right? And Tom Brady joined me one year later. <laughs> and then I began to watch Patriots games. And now you know, the rest is history, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, th th actually this is my family. So uh, actually I, I owe a lot of uh, my gratitude to my my wife, you know, my, can you? So, uh, and you see, I took at least one of us has saw at least one Michigan game, right? So this is uh, me, my wife, <laughs> my <laughs> the little girl grew up, right? So, uh, okay, so I also did this, right? I also did a camping and I, at least I got one fish, right? <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so I think this I I I forgot that probably I did uh I did the canoeing probably at you know at Michigan Lake. Oh I forgot, but anyways I got this thing. Okay, back then. So why I'm so familiar with Michigan. Okay, so just a little bit of history. Uh, I think actually uh, um Everybody heard about this guns quick paper, right? For the for people come from East Asia, but for the people may not be uh, so familiar, this is called the Boxer Rebellion Indemnity Scholarship Program, right? So history. Many years ago, there's a Chinese boxers, right? They rebelled, they uh, 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 attacked the foreigners, especially the like the German, American, British um, missionaries, right? Then the allied forces decided to intervene. Okay, and then they just uh, quelled the rebellion um, of the boxers movement. And then they asked the Chinese government, the Qing, Qing government, to now you have to pay back because you killed our people, right? And then you pay back. Then basically they asked the Qing dynasty to pay from 
four four hundred fifty million pairs of a silver as indemnity. So I checked one one pair of silver is like one U.S. dollar back back then. Okay, basically why this is basically each Chinese pay one dollar, right? So at at that time I actually learned like a four hundred fifty billion Chinese people there. So everybody you know pay one dollar. Okay, so then after uh, eight years. The U.S. said, "Oh, we, we got too much too much money from China. We we need to return back to them." <laughs> so they instead they say, "Oh, they just set up this scholarship." They say, "Okay, we want to sponsor the Chinese students to come to U.S. to study, so that uh, you know we want to make sure um, this this uh, boxer movement should not happen again, right?" Okay, so back then. Uh, so from 1909 and 1911, so they sent three waves of Chinese students to uh, to U.S. They 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 were um, they they actually they studied at Harvard. They studied at uh, UPenn. They studied at uh, you know Dartmouth or so on, right? And also certainly they some of them also studied at the University of Michigan. Okay, back then there was a little boy called. Uh, and Chi Chen. Okay, so now I want to say why I'm I'm talking about the connection, right? My my family connection, right? So unfortunately, this is the first wave, second wave, and then Tan Chi Chen actually was in the third wave. There's no photo, right? So but you can see, well, back then they were just look like, like this. Okay. Well, it turns out he's my mother's grandfather. Uh, my mother's father, my maternal uh, grandfather, so Tan Chi Chen. So you can see here, if he did uh, his uh, journey lecture, he would uh, say, oh, he uh, he graduated from a uh, Tsinghua College, right? Actually, basically just Tsinghua University then, right? And then he arrived in uh, Michigan 1911, right? And then he got uh, his uh, uh, master, uh, bachelor's degree uh, nine, four years later, and then got his um, um, a master degree one year later. So I don't know actually if this is just a coincidence or not, right? Basically, 100 years, I I rejoined the Michigan. So I came to Michigan in 2011, and then my 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 grandfather, you know, came to Michigan in 1911, right? Actually, he. He used to live in Thompson Street. Actually, the apartment there uh, was still it still exists. So, uh, so this. So, if you just do uh, Wikipedia, and you can get you know more information uh, for 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 this gentleman or my grandpa. Okay. So, uh, so certainly, my the familiar ties with Michigan continued, right? So, uh, I'm very happy to report that my daughter Tiffany Lee. Uh, joined Michigan as a freshman last year, and then actually I asked her to uh, to come to this talk. She refused because <laughs> I was very trying. I was trying very hard to let her study uh, statistics. But yesterday he sent me a message telling me, "Daddy, ninety five companies in her really doesn't make any sense to me." <laughs> Okay, so but <laughs> okay, so um, uh, um, so so there are just this uh, uh, looking back, right? So looking back, uh, I, I, I'm not sure uh, would this be work, would would be uh, this working uh for anybody else, but for me at least, uh, I I think actually um. I, I tend to be a little bit curious and uh, motivated, right? So I, I think if you want to do something, if you are not curious, if you are not motivated, you are only just saying, oh, this is just something I have to do, most likely it's unlikely you you will go you know, much, uh, much, far, uh, much farther, okay? And then if you have your goal, you have to be a little bit persistent, right? You have to keep doing this. Uh, especially when you, uh, you know, submit your papers, submit your grants, you have to keep doing that, right? Do not let the do not let the barriers define you, right? You have to overcome that, and also get help. 
and offer help, right? So basically, this means that you do not be like um, also always just try to help the people who need who are needed, and also you should feel very happy that you you are needed, right? And also, I I think I I got all my training, you know, from Michigan, from Harvard. I really like those two institutes. Uh, you know, both of them are great. So of course, here um, Michigan is great, right? Okay, so I really uh, thank you everybody here and especially my my group, right? So this group actually has a special meaning to me because you actually we up with each other and then we pass this whole pandemic, right? So that's why I owe a lot of thanks to my group here. But also I really appreciate uh, having this opportunity to share my personal stories, you know, with everybody here. So, you know, I, I, I tend to think I'm a very private guy, so I hold everything to myself, but this is the first time I even uh, shared what my daughter had told me to everybody, right? So, but do not tell me back. You will, if you are my student, don't, don't tell me that 95 competency will interval do not make any sense, right? <laughs> Okay, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very inspiring journey lecture. So I'm going to ask the audience, do you guys have any questions or comments? Any comments from collaborators? Too complicated? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't have one question. So have you conducted any inference analysis on the relation between your attention on the football games and their wings. <laughs> well, that's uh, that that is very good question. So I I I, I find actually I, I did do a little bit uh, um, because actually I will be able to do a little bit of random file, right? I find actually I need to follow the football, but I do I do not have to watch the football game. Because whenever I watch it, they lose, right? <laughs> but if I follow them, you know, and read this game after the match, normally they win. But I, I did do this, you know, read my trial just today because I said, oh, I'm going to watch the Tom Brady play, right? Normally, people is going to lose. But if I stop watching, normally Tom Brady will win. So I think actually, uh, there, I, I, can, I, even, I even did this like a random trial. I think this is even better than all the universe. <laughs> <laughs> You can call the inference need a lot of assumptions. Right. But we'll take these causal relation with that winning to be true. Yeah, I, uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's that's like a miracle, right? So the, uh, you know, there's a Michigan won the football national championship and the hockey championship the same year when I really focus on that. And then when I look at the, when I just uh, you know follow the Patriots game, they just established the dynasty. So that's it. Anyway, so that's just funny. Yeah. No, I don't think that's right. I really play any role. So. <laughs> it's just funny. So yeah, actually, I'm curious, you know, because you mentioned your grandpa of a graduate from here, you joined the Michigan twice. So during those times when you make try to make a decision, did your family or grandpa give you any suggestions or mom? Um, so first of all, my, my grandpa passed away many years uh, before. So I, I wouldn't think it, it, it's a uh, determined. I, I don't think actually it, 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 it's, it, it's a most important factor. Mm -hmm. But because of this ties, I am maybe I'm just genetically connected with this here. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I feel very familiar with this. Uh, this environment, so it doesn't take much time you know, for me to make my decision. So. What is his major? <laughs> um, thank you. The uh, economics uh -huh. and the political uh -huh. science. Okay. So that's why you try economics first. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions from the audience? Sure. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you. Again, uh, wonderful talk. I gotta say, I know a lot more about you now. I'm just curious because um, I think that I just wonder what's the most difficult period of time and how do you overcome during your career? Because it's a long career from the presentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's deeply personal, so feel free not to say anything. But yeah, 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 yeah. I, 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 I can tell you actually. Well, I think actually there's a one particular uh, time period I felt very, very difficult. So that that is uh, for the re renewal of my grant. Okay, so. 
um, by, so, you know, after your NIH grant, right, four years, right, you have to renew the grant, right? So I put together my uh, application. Uh, the first time I didn't get, uh, uh, I didn't get uh, immediately renewed, right? So I saw oh, I can just uh, address, you know, all the comments and I resubmitted it, right? Then second time I thought actually I did everything the referee asked. I, and I felt actually I, I should get a very good score, right? No, the second time came back, my score was even worse. I was so, so sad. That was the most uh, difficult time in my career. Because, you know, back at Harvard, actually, you know, you, you have to have, you know, the grant, right? So, oh, I feel actually my career is over. And then, uh, I, and I, 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 I felt so sad. And then, fortunately, um, I was uh, able to get some like moral support from uh, Louis Ryan and Shi uh, Hong, and also you cannot re uh, Rick Carroll. Rick Carroll said, uh, uh, "I don't know. There's no way I can relieve your anxiety or your sadness, right?" But he said, "Oh, even even I, you know, Rick Carroll." He said, "Oh, you know, several 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 uh, several days ago, I submitted something, but it was not uh, it was not approved either. So hopefully, this can make you better. So it will feel you better." But then. Um, but the, the, the thing is, okay, even you feel very down, very sad, as I said, the second bullet point is be persistent, right? So I still got the last chance because back then, NIH grants had, had three chances, right? A0, A1, A2. So it turns out my A2, finally my A2 was successful. So, <laughs> so it was very challenging, very, um, very sad, but, uh, but do not give up, right? So I think actually the third time actually was a charm. So yeah, thank you. That's very, yeah, that's, the, I, I, I still remember the date when I, when I just noticed my second, because, you know, normally when you, uh, you, you keep looking to your NIH you know, website, web, web page, right? You pray, right? I would pray, right? So, and when the score popped up, right? Still 38 percentile, oh, I was so, so sad. So I still remember that day. Thank you very much for, for that. Okay. okay, so, but anyway, so the, but the, the I, I, I think the story here is that you, you have to keep trying, right? Do not give up. Yeah, good question. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the, the, the question is that when I decided I, I should choose a statistic as my as my major, right? Yeah. Okay. So, uh. Probably uh, you can see that uh, uh, my, you know, I'm I'm mostly actually I'm I'm trained by by mathematics by mathematicians, right? So my I'm trained, you know, in math major, right? So in mathematics, basically you are not allowed to have any assumptions, right? So normally actually the fewer assumptions, the better, right? So that's why when I transitioned to statistics, of course, the first question here is, I, I, I am interested in statistics, I, I am interested in bio, in particular biostatistics, because I'm really interested in how to use mathematics you know, to solve the you know, biological or medical uh, problems, right? So that is something I wanna do. Okay, but, I think actually, even if you have an interest, that may not be that may may not be you know, enough. You still have to you know develop your you know technical skill and also make your transition you know successful. Because actually, in my first year, I found the actual transition very very hard because actually the philosophy between mathematics and uh, statistics is quite different. Because actually, by that time. 
I have no idea what do you mean by sufficient statistic or complete sufficient statistic, right? I find actually those those assumptions here are so weird, right? Because actually in mathematics, we only care about existence, right? One only wants their existence, something that's the end of the exercise. But in in statistics, we need to tell you, you need to give the answer what the final answer is, right? So that's why there exists some fundamental differences between those two subjects, right? Even though they are very closely connected, the basics are still different, right? So that's why I think that once you develop your interest, you still have to make sure you have enough knowledge and also you have enough motivation to overcome you know, any possible barriers. Yeah, I think that's something I've done. All right, so thank you very much. And also the department has prepared a little gift bag and the certificate to show our appreciation oh, for all your tremendous contributions wow. to the department. Mm -hmm. I know that you said you randomly pick Steve mm -hmm. and you were joking about that. However, I know all your lab members are here. Uh -huh. So I'm going to invite all your students to come here and to take a photo together. Oh. I'm sure, I'm sure your fellow students will be among them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So sure. Steve, okay, and invite your friends to come. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a certificate, and you can do that. You know, and then you can do that. I'll get a photo of you two first and see if we can introduce them. Oh, that's good. Sure. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, everyone, everyone gonna expose me. Okay, thank you. Thank you all very much for coming. We can the last two are actually upstairs, so it gives some food for your dinner. Here's the wrap up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.